But I want to start this morning with a question. And I know there's at least one in the room, but is anyone here a picky eater? Any picky eaters? The, the one hand I was anticipating would go up went straight up and there's a few other hands going up there as well. But I'm a huge believer that if you're paying for something, you should be able to request that it comes without the stuff that you don't like, right? If you're paying for something, you should be able to request that it comes without the stuff that you don't like. So whenever Chloe and I are at a restaurant, for example, and the chicken stack and sugar rays is served with champ rather than mash, I, as the customer, have the right to request that it be served with mash instead. Because, as you know, the difference between champ and mash is scallions or spring onions. And I don't like spring onions or scallions. And quite frankly, I don't want the taste of the sharp, the sharp taste of the scallions overpowering and taking away from the flavor of the mash and the chicken, the tobacco onions, and the peppercorn sauce, which is all blended together in a mouse and a mouthful of mmm, mmm, magnifique, right? Very good stuff. But similarly, there are instances that when ordering things, People would get it without this and we get it with a little bit extra of that. And Chloe's favorite is whenever you go to somewhere and you can create your own. Create your own. For that takes the guessing out of everything and you're definitely only left with the stuff that you like. And you can enjoy it without the fear of coming across something that you don't like. But sadly, however, whenever we read the scriptures, there will inevitably be times that we come across passages or parts which we would much rather leave out. Parts which we would rather put to the side or just completely forget about. Yes, even before we come into a relationship with Christ, Paul reminds us that we would have considered the preaching of the cross to be foolishness. Yet, to us who are saved, we know that it is the power of God. As we continue our journey with the Spirit, as he sanctifies us and conforms us more and more into the image of Christ, we are often shaped and molded in ways that are uncomfortable, ways that are perhaps even unpleasant, and ways which force us to face up to the realities which are the requirements of being a true disciple, a true follower. Of Jesus Christ. These things cause us to self-examine and put right wrong attitudes, misconceptions and even ingrained beliefs, very often ingrained because of the culture in which we have grown up in. But to, they cause us to put these things right which are not in keeping with the kingdom of God as heirs of that kingdom and as heirs of the grace of life. And I'll be honest with you, if today's topics were on a restaurant menu, I would ask for my meal without them. However, the word of God is not a menu and we can't pick and choose which parts we like and which parts we don't. But rather, the word of God, every single word, is inspired by God and contains everything which we need for a godly life. And therefore, the whole council, even the bits that we don't like, Every word is useful and is required. Now to help us understand this a little bit more, I've come up with an acronym. Um, an acronym. And it's not a new acronym, it was an acronym that was used during the Cold War, both in the Soviet Union and the West as they engaged in what was known as MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction. And if you want to know more about that, we're not gonna do that here. You can go and speak to our Doctor of History and Politics, Dr. Graham Greenley, and I'm sure that he would more than happily fill you in on that. But I would like to suggest to us this morning that we live in a mad world. We live in a mad world. And whilst it might not stand for mutually assured destruction, today, for the rest of our time together, we're gonna to take a short look at murder, adultery, and divorce. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? 
murder, adultery, and divorce. And we're not going to dance around it, we're just going to jump right in. So firstly, murder. You have heard it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. This is Jesus in Matthew 5 from verse 21. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Racha, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at, an altar, at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle, matter, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge. And the judge may hand you over to the officer. And you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you. You will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Who's really glad they're here? Right? What we have in these verses, though, what we have in these verses is an example of Jesus exercising and speaking with his God-given authority. The Greeks understood authority as the power to add and the power to take away at will. And here Jesus is exercising that authority. Jesus, as he will in the next two examples, also he takes part of the law of Moses and he expounds upon it. And he does so unapologetically and he does so without argument. You see, next week Pastor Ryan will be considering uh, Pastor Ryan will be considering how Jesus came not to abolish the law, but rather to fulfil the law. And you may notice that we jumped ahead because I didn't think it was fair. Uh, leaving the number to a um, murder, adultery and divorce. But we're going to look and we're going to explore together how Jesus came to uh, not to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it. And in that fulfillment, we see that Jesus here is speaking with authority. And in this speaking with authority, he also does another thing. He doesn't just expound upon the law, but he raises the bar. He raises the bar, he raises the expectations, and he raises the standards of those who call themselves disciples. Jesus teaches that it's not only the man who committed murder who was guilty, but the man who was angry with his brother was also guilty and therefore liable to punishment. Jesus' teaching was that it, wasn't, it was not good enough just simply to not commit murder. Do you want to be pat on the back? For not committing murder but that the only sufficient thing was never even to wish to commit murder see jesus raises the standard of his own requirements step by step until the whole command until the whole law is transformed you shall not commit murder it, it's it's in the big ten isn't it it's in the Big Ten. It's one of, one of those contained within the Ten Commandments which were given, by, given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. And as such, it wouldn't have got lost on the Jews amongst their 613 Mosaic laws by which they sought to live their lives. This was one of the, the big ones. You shall not commit murder. But Jesus takes this command he takes this commandment and he transforms it and he transforms it step by step firstly he says that anger which is harbored in the heart may take on a murderous aspect and bring us in danger of facing condemnation ourselves just because we haven't committed the murder doesn't mean that we're not liable for the consequences then he takes that step, another step further, and he talks about contempt, that which is implied by the Hebrew word racha, 
Racha, which was maybe the word as we read along, you were like, what on earth does that mean? Has the pastor made another typo? No, it's a Hebrew word, Racha. And it, it, it speaks of contempt and it cuts and it wounds more deeply. And its effect has an even more lasting effect than hot anger, which cools quickly. You see, Racha is deliberate and it's cruel. It's calculated. It seeks to tear down, it seeks to defame, and it seeks to slander. And whilst it may not cause physical harm to an individual, it very often kills them in different ways. It kills their reputation. It kills their self-confidence. It kills their relationships. It causes their mental health to suffer greatly. And for this reason, Jesus meets Racha with strong condemnation as well. But then the Hebrew word translated into our English as you fool. You maybe see as we were reading along, it sort of escalated a little bit and we landed at you fool. The Hebrew word used that's translated as you fool literally means in the Hebrew, godless one. You godless one. You heathen. You godless one. And it actually implies a curse upon that person, as well as slandered, slanderous hatred being poured over their life as well. This is a terrible, terrible sin of the soul and is likened by Jesus in this analogy. Again, we've got to remember that he was speaking in a first century Jewish context and part of the implications which he makes are lost on you and I. But Jesus in this analogy likens this to being thrown into the valley of Gihinom, which was outside of Jerusalem. And this is where all kinds of filth and refuge were continually burnt outside the city walls. You think that the you think that the landfills are bad? This was a Jewish equivalent of a landfill, but a landfill that was continually set on fire to ensure that everything decomposed and that only ash was left. And Jesus compares, saying, you fool, he compares this, this godless one, he compares it to throwing an individual into that valley. Jesus isn't messing around here. He's not mincing his words and neither should he. You see, if not checked and surrendered to God, anger can very quickly grow out of control and it can cause us to fall into heinous sin. And the more frequently it's allowed to fester, the less likely we are to notice that it's happening in the first place. The more it's allowed to fester, the more it becomes normal. And the more something becomes normal and becomes a habit, the more we overlook it, particularly in ourselves. Jesus, in his grace and in his mercy, instructs us, however. He doesn't just say, this is awful, don't do it. In his grace and in his mercy, he instructs us how we can get out of that cycle, how we can get out of that way of life and how we can, with the help of the Spirit, ensure that we don't fall victim to punishment and instead fulfill the kingdom mandate which he gives to us as his disciples. And you'll be really glad to know that his principle is a really simple and straightforward one. The principle is this. Stop whatever you're doing and go sort it out. Stop whatever you're doing and go sort it out. It's very novel, isn't it? If you've wronged somebody, go put it right. Apologise and seek their forgiveness. If someone's wronged you, go and tell them. Lest you start to harbour resentment against them in your heart. Maybe you're a little bit like me. And maybe I shouldn't admit this from the front, but sometimes I find myself going... They need to apologise to me. I'm going to wait for them to come and apologise. Here Jesus instructs us. 
He always puts the ball in our court. So if you've wronged somebody, go sort it out. Apologise, seek their forgiveness. If somebody's wronged you, go and let them know about it. Go and let them know and check it out. This cannot be stressed enough. Stop whatever you're doing and go and sort it out. And Jesus sees this matter as so vital that he commands us to stop our sacrifice, to stop praying, to stop worshipping, to stop the sermon and go and sort it out. This is how important this and is and it's how serious this matter is. So right now, right now, we're going to stop. And I encourage you that if anyone who has wronged or been wronged, who has been untruthful about another, whatever it may be, we're going to stop. And we're going to give each one of us an opportunity to go and put something right. So what I really encourage you to do, and I know this is really awkward, but if Jesus takes this serious, we need to take it serious too. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to sit down for two minutes and I encourage everybody to close their eyes and bow their heads. But if you've got to go and sort something out, go and sort it out. If you've got to go sort something out, go sort it out. So I'll stop the video and we'll do just that. It's a mad world. Murder. Now adultery. From verse 27 in chapter 5, Jesus says, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, guide your light and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I would just like to state for the record, Jesus is of course speaking metaphorically here. Don't guide your eye out, don't cut your arm off. I'm sure the nurse would agree with me here. But Jesus is speaking metaphorically, but he's using very strong language. Very strong language. You might remember that as we looked at the Beatitudes together, that the one in the very center of them was blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And as we considered that teaching together, we were reminded that without Christ, the heart was and is deceitful and wicked above all things. And how Jesus himself in Mark 7, 21 to 22 states that for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. We live in a fallen world. We live in a mad world where people are encouraged to follow their heart. Follow your heart. And as a result, we see the outworking of the disease that is sin showing itself in a variety of ways and in a variety of symptoms. And adultery is one of those symptoms. I don't need to go to great lengths this morning to preach against adultery. I think everybody around the room and everybody in the room would say, adultery bad. Adultery is not good. Adultery is bad. You shall not commit adultery, just like murder is one of the big ten. One of the com ten commandments. And it's widely known that adultery is wrong. That it is detestable in the sight of God. But as he did with murder, Jesus takes this command and he raises the expectations and he raises the standards. It is not only the person who committed adultery who is guilty, but also the person who allowed the unclean, lustful desire to settle in their heart who is also guilty. Jesus teaches that it's not just enough to be faithful to your wife or faithful to your husband. It's not just enough 
just to not commit adultery. The only thing sufficient was never to wish to commit adultery in the first place. And our bodies have been given to us as an instrument. And the body in which sex is one of the strongest natural <coughs> instincts. And it has been given by us to God, uh, by, by God to us in order not only to procreate, but also to be enjoyed as a gift within the confines of a loving marriage between a man and a woman. The church, it seems, is always on the back foot whenever it comes to the topic of sex. And there may be some individuals, even in this room, who are not happy with me using that word in your presence this morning. But the reality is we live in a sexualized world and in a world where anything goes, where pretty much anything can be accessed at the click of a button. Anything can be accessed at the click of a button and people of all ages can access any sort of sexual activity they so wish if they have the right device without the right filters on. Sex has become an evil. It has become a taboo subject. I can even see some of you going, oh please, I hope this bit's over soon. And the church, for some reason, has found, we find ourselves on the back foot. But the reality is this, that if we don't teach our children and our young people, if we don't teach our people and young converts the truth, then the world will give it their version. The world will give it their version. This warped, inaccurate and grotesque picture of what was actually given by God as a gift. And when exercised correctly, that is within the confines of heterosexual marriage, this gift is a real blessing. But when we self-indulge our own will, when we step outside of those parameters, those confines that God has given, we make the body for a time the master over us instead of an instrument given to us for the glory of God. By the standards of the world, you're a good person if you don't do what you're not supposed to do. But by Jesus' standards, we are only ever good when we are pure in heart and desire him. When we surrender our wills and our temptations and the things that pull us this way and that way to him. And today, friends, if you find yourself down a rabbit hole, stuck in the throes of an addiction, or in the shame of your mistakes, the good news for you is this, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light and he bids you come and he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All we have to do is come. It's a mad world. Murder, adultery, are we still here? Yeah. Lastly, divorce. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorced his wife except for sexual immorality makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Marriage is one of the oldest and most sacred institutions of God. It was established at the beginning of creation. I feel like I'm at the wedding, right? But it was established at the beginning of creation. It was graced by the personal presence of Christ himself in the New Testament. And it was even likened to the mystical union which exists between Christ and the church. Marriage is honourable before all mankind. And it is right, good and proper for a man to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Those who enter into this covenant relationship of marriage should cherish and esteem and love one another, bear with each other throughout the good times and the bad, comfort one another in sickness and in trouble and in sorrow, and in honesty and determination provide for each other that they may live together as heirs of the grace of life. 
Speaking into a day and age wherever, whenever men were using the Mosaic law as a weapon to divorce their wives on technicalities, technicalities which were very often because they found someone else more attractively appealing than their wife at the time. Speaking into this reality, Jesus speaks truth and upheld once again the sanctity of marriage. We, we live in a society where family life is not valued as it once was. Divorce rates are high. Marriage has become more about convenience than it has about a covenant of and two becoming one flesh. We read in Malachi chapter one that God hates divorce. And that's true because it's in the Bible. But it is true However, it is important to know that there are biblical grounds for divorce which are given in the scripture. They're stated here in Matthew as adultery and then again in 1 Corinthians as abandonment. And, and Christians, and as Christians, you and I are, guided, are to be guided by the living spirit of Christ. And we are to understand that whilst God never commands divorce, there are occasions where he does permit it. He is a faithful and loving God who loves his children. Now, I'm not qualified to speak into each and every individual situation, nor do I pretend to be. But marriage is sacred. It is to be between one man and one woman. It should not be entered into lightly and Christ by his spirit comes to our aid. I remember at Chloe and I's wedding, Pastor Norman took the ceremony and he talked about how a, how a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And then he tied a strand and got me to break it and I couldn't break it. Then he gave it to Chloe and she broke it and kind of ruined the illustration a little bit. <laughs> oh, that was a single strand. Apparently I'm just weak. Who knew? But he was using it as an illustration of how a strand of three, three a cord of three strands is not easily broken. It is the intention and it is the ideal of God that he is the center of any marriage. The center of any marriage. And by his spirit, he comes to our aid. He enables us to love one another whenever the other one is being unlovely. He enables us to cherish one another when all we'd rather do is give him a good shake. Some of you have been married longer than I've been alive. And I'm sure that you can testify today that there are times where it wasn't always roses in the garden. But you're still here. You're still standing. And you know what? That's the way God intended it to be. We live in a culture where if it's broken, let's just chuck it out and get a new one. But God's ideal, God's ideal is the joining together of two who become one flesh. And by his spirit, he helps in that. Because it's not always roses in the garden. It's not always easy. But it's always worth it because he's always there he's always there and there are two grounds which are clearly given in the scriptures for divorce however a god of love would never force a woman or a man to remain in a living hell for the rest of their lives, such as is the case of domestic abuse, for example. He would never, would never force them to remain merely in order to fulfill a legal obligation because that's not in the spirit of Christ's teaching. We do, we live in a mad world, but I'm glad today that this mad world is not our eternal home. Jillian read to us earlier from Revelation 22, and that wasn't just a, a random 
a random verse, verses that were picked up. But this mad world is not our eternal home. We are kingdom bearers. We are Christ's ambassadors here on earth and our citizenship is in heaven. And we are to live lives which reflect the teaching and the reality of that kingdom. And my twins are buzzing about that kingdom. They think it's gonna be great. But we are not only to pray, but to live out that prayer that we pray in which we say, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. You've done really well today. I've struggled my way through this. But with the Lord's help, truth has been spoken. And whilst it may not have been comfortable, whilst it may not have been the reason that you got up this morning and came to church, it is useful. It is useful for each one of us. For it is the word of God, the living word of the living God for us, his living people that we may be kingdom bearers wherever we go, that we may be the people that he has called us to be for such a time as this. And as the band come, let us sing of the hope that awaits us, the hope of that kingdom. And let us surrender ourselves to the will of that kingdom, that our mad world might know the hope and love of the king and his kingdom. So let's stand together as we close together.